Hi everyone and welcome back to Minds and Machines with me, Dr. Josh Redstone. So what we're going to do today is begin taking a look at something called machine functionalism. Machine functionalism is the brainchild of Hilary Putnam, who was an important analytic philosopher in the mid to late 20th century in the analytic tradition. So um, we'll be taking a look at Putnam's 1960 paper, Minds and Machines. This is one of the papers in which he starts to outline some of the fundamentals of machine functionalism. And today we'll be taking a look at two ideas in particular that we can find in that paper. One of those ideas is functionalism itself, and the other is an idea called multiple realizability. Functionalism and multiple realizability kind of are like this, you know? Um, it's hard to have one without the other, and we'll see why. Uh, by the time we get through with this lecture. Now, I mentioned that we will be looking at Putnam's paper, Minds and Machines. Um, we're not going to do a close reading of the paper today because it is kind of a, a difficult read. Um, I mean, this paper was written in the 1960s, and Putnam is kind of jumping into a debate, um, well, several debates, really, um, some which concern something called identity theory, uh, he talks a lot about Turing machines, of course, thus machine functionalism. Um, so there's identity theory, uh, Turing machines, and he also talks about the mind-body problem a little bit. So there's a lot that's packed into this little paper. So before we look at some of that stuff, I thought that what we would do is take a look at the previously mentioned ideas first, functionalism and multiple realizability. So we'll cover the rest of the stuff in our next lecture. Today's lecture, by the way, will also be a little shorter than usual. I know I say that a lot, but it will be a little shorter than usual in the interest of getting ourselves caught up with the material. And I should note um, that uh, some of uh, the materials that I'm presenting in this lecture are based upon a previous lecture I do for another class, Intro to Cognitive Science. For that, I used uh, Jose Luis Bermudez's book, um, Cognitive Science, An Introduction to the Science of the Mind. Um, and I use the second edition, 2014, published in 2014. So if any of you are curious, you can follow up with some of the things that I'm talking about today in that book, as well as in Putnam's paper. And of course, I highly recommend that you all check out the um, first couple sections of the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy article on functionalism. It lays things out quite clearly. Anyway, uh, that's the plan for today. So let's get into it. So who was Hilary Putnam? Well, uh, this guy. So Hilary Putnam was born in 1926 and passed away um, not that long ago in 2016. And as I mentioned before, he was an important figure in the analytic tradition uh, throughout his career, which spanned uh, mid to late uh, 20th century and a little bit into the early, early uh, 21st century. He's made some very important contributions in a lot of areas, such as the philosophy of language. If any of you are taking a philosophy of language course now or in the near future, you'll likely read about Putnam's twin earth thought experiment. He made important contributions to the philosophy of mathematics and the philosophy of science as well. And of course, important contributions to the philosophy of mind by drawing upon uh, some of Turing's work by critiquing some of the drawbacks of identity theory, which we'll talk a little bit about next time. And of course, by introducing the ideas that we'll learn about today, namely functionalism and multiple realizability. Now, I should say that later on in his career, Putnam actually started to uh, kind of abandon the original version of functionalism, of machine functionalism, that he pitches in papers like the one that we're going to look at today. Nonetheless, functionalism is probably the dominant view amongst philosophers of mind and cognitive scientists when it comes to how to understand the mind. So what does that mean? That's what we'll be learning about today. So let's take a look at what functionalism actually is. So what is functionalism? And this, again, without getting too deep into the nitty-gritty of Putnam's paper, because you kind of have to search around for these little 
nuggets of functionalism and multiple realizability in there. Um, what, what is functionalism? Well, remember last time when we were talking about Turing, um, we learned that Turing helped formu formalize computation. What Turing basically did was give a mechanized algorithmic account of computation as information processing. Uh, computation is rule-governed information processing, right? And following Turing's work, other philosophers of mind, like Putnam, of course, also started thinking of the human mind as an information processing machine. The human mind, uh, functionally speaking, is a lot like a Turing machine. So, if the mind is an information processing machine, uh, again, this is also one of the uh, dominant views in philosophy of mind and the cognitive sciences now, that the mind is an information processing machine or a natural computer, then we can try to understand it in a couple of different ways. We could just look at the machinery, right? And this is what a lot of the thinkers we've talked about so far have kind of done. They've looked at the machinery. What does the brain do? How does it control the body and so forth? How does information affect the senses to create mental representations, right? Um, we could look at just the machinery, or we could examine what the mind does. What does the mind actually do? What is the mind's function? How does the mind function, right? Uh, we can just look at that and forget about the machinery, actually, and just look at functional relations between parts of this system that we call the mind. I guess if you want to simplify things, approach number one, you know, just studying the machinery would be a bit like studying the hardware of the mind, you know, studying the brain, doing brain scans, seeing how neurons are firing and wiring and so forth, just studying the hardware, right? Approach number two would be a bit more like studying the software, or perhaps more precisely, treating the mind as a formal system that we use for thinking. Um, and, I, and I say this, you know, more precisely, air quotes, because the mindware software, or sorry, um, the hardware software um, analogy with the, the brain and the mind is, you know, not the best analogy. It works in some senses, but it also doesn't work in other senses. Um, so, uh, that's why we say, you know, talk about the mind as if it's a functional system, uh, or some kind of formal system that we think in. Um, and we're not going to dive too much into the details of what formal systems are today. I will be doing that more next time. I just want to get the bare bones idea of functionalism across to you all today. Now, um, going back to option number one versus option number two, most cognitive scientists and philosophers of mind nowadays take approach number two. We study the software, or rather we study the mind as a functional system. We don't need to worry so much about the hardware of the brain, which might sound a bit weird, but you know, part of the reason why this is such a, a big, uh, lasting, influential approach is because of Putnam's work, and also because it wasn't until um, the 1980s that we really started to get, on the one hand, the neuroimaging technology uh, that allowed us to look at brain events in real time with a relatively good degree of spatial granularity. And number two, um, because it was only until the 1980s that we, uh, it wasn't until the 1980s that we figured out how to train neural networks to model uh, neural networks in the brain, to train artificial neural networks, I should say. So there's a few reasons why uh, cognitive scientists and philosophers thought we could ignore the brain. Um, uh, and one of those reasons uh, is Putnam's work. And another has to do with uh, brain scanning technology or neuro, uh, neuro modeling technology and so forth. But the big two ideas introduced by Putnam that are important here are, of course, as I've said repeatedly, functionalism and multiple realizability. So remember, as I mentioned a moment ago, on functionalism, we treat the mind as a functional system. What does that mean? Well, it means that instead of looking at what it's made of or how it is 
physically realized, that is looking at a brain or a Turing machine or a computer or whatnot, instead of doing that, we try to understand the mind in terms of what it does and how it does it, right? Rather than what it's made of. We don't need to worry about the particulars of the physical structures that we actually implement those functions on. Instead, we want to understand the functional relations between parts of the system. Now, I'm not going to say too much about formal systems today, um, but uh, when we're talking about functional relations between parts of a system, you can think of this in terms of uh, like a computer software or a computer programming language or a, uh, or a Turing machine, which is what Putnam does. Um, you could think of this in terms of, uh, you know, um, logical languages, right? These are uh, all systems that are made of parts, right? They have parts for expressing uh, sentences, for joining sentences together. Um, you know, uh, we, can, we can say things, we can state things in these systems. So we can use the parts of the systems to build axioms, to derive proofs, to say things about things, so on and so forth. And it doesn't really matter what symbols we use, right? Whether it's ones and zeros or some kind of logical calculus. What matters is what uh, the symbols represent and the relations between the symbols. On functionalism, the mind is kind of like that too. The mind is like a Turing machine in that way, or a computer program, if you like. Uh, it doesn't matter, um, you know, the physical structures don't matter as much as the functional relations between the parts in the system is the main idea behind functionalism. To make this a little bit more concrete, uh, let's use an example, uh, and this example, of course, is drawn from uh, the Bermuda's textbook I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. Let's think of a different kind of machine. You know, we, let's bracket the question, is the mind a machine? And let's look at a different kind of natural machinery, the heart. What is it that makes something a heart, right? Is it what it's made of? I mean, um, my heart and yours uh, and everyone's, pretty much, is made of uh, muscle cells, right? And they uh, beat. They can all beat because there's an electrical pulse going through your heart and uh, that makes the muscles beat like this and the heart pumps blood. Is that what makes something a heart? Well, maybe. Um, is it how many chambers the heart has? Mm, maybe. I mean, we have four chambers in our hearts, right? Um, but other creatures have a different number of chambers, so that could be problematic if we tried to talk about, you know, the structure and makeup of hearts being their defining characteristic. What about the size of a heart, or how many times it beats per minute, right? Like a hummingbird has a, a very, very small heart, which beats hundreds and hundreds of times per minute. A blue whale, on the other hand, uh, the largest creature ever to have lived, has an enormous heart. You could drive a Volkswagen through the heart of a blue whale, you know, and it beats fewer times per minute than ours does, let alone the hummingbird, right? So what makes something a heart? If we can't agree uh, on, uh, on any of the details of the you know, physical machinery of hearts. Uh, is there something about the, f the, the, the machinery of hearts that makes it a heart? The physical stuff that it's made out of? No, not according to the functionalist perspective. A functionalist would tell you that the essential feature or defining characteristic of a heart is that it pumps deoxygenated blood to the lungs so that that blood can be reoxygenated, and it plump, pumps that reoxygenated blood to all the cells in the brain and the body so that those cells have some oxygen uh, so that they don't die. So for a functionalist, what the heart is made of or what its physical structure is like doesn't matter. What matters is the function the heart fulfills, namely um, pumping deoxygenated blood to the lungs and pumping reoxygenated blood throughout your circulatory system to oxygenate all the cells in your body, right? So that means that many different things would count as a heart as long as they performed the right function. For example, I could have, you know, an artificial implant, perhaps, um, Maybe I have some kind of congenital heart defect and it needs replacement. 
So instead of getting uh, a heart transplant from another human, maybe I get one of those uh, fancy cybernetic robot hearts, you know? Uh, I'd be like a cyborg. A uh, blue whale's heart, like I mentioned before, is uh, like you could drive a Volkswagen van through one of those things. They're enormous. But it's still a heart because it does the same thing, even though the physical structure of a whale's heart, indeed, and a whale's entire physical structure is much different than that of a human heart. Or like think of uh, like fish, reptiles, their hearts have different numbers of chambers than human hearts do, but they still do the same job. They pump deoxygenated blood, well in the case of fish, to the gills instead of the lungs, um, and then they recirculate oxygenated blood throughout the rest of the organism's body. That is what makes something a heart from a functionalist perspective. Now, the important uh, takeaway here is that the same thing can be said for the mind, uh, if you're a functionalist. What matters is uh, the relations between uh, functional states in the system, not what it's made of. So um, we can have a mind in the brain, right? The brain uh, is one way to realize a mind. And... Um, how we define mental states, for example, being in pain, uh, is a matter of uh, functional relations between parts of that system. Putnam's going to say, uh, you know, it's not contingent upon something physical that we can identify in the brain, like your C-fibers firing, right? Uh, it has to do with functional relations between states in the system. And for this reason, functionalists will also say that, uh, you know, computers might be able to have minds right? Um, alien life forms with vastly different physiologies than our own would have minds and have mental states, right? So this is the important thing for a functionalist, the function uh, that the mind fulfills or that mental states fulfill. That's what makes something a mental state, is the function it fulfills in the system. Um, so that's functionalism. Um, and that leads us to the second important idea I want to introduce to you today, which is multiple realizability. So let's take a look at multiple realizability now. All right, well, multiple realizability. Well, remember uh, a moment ago when I said that to a functionalist, the physical realization of your system, whatever you're looking at, whether it's a brain or a computer, is not as important as the functional relations between the parts of the system, right? So it doesn't matter to a functionalist how your mind is implemented or physically realized. It could be realized in a uh, meat machine like my brain, or perhaps there's... Um, silicon-based life forms out there in the universe somewhere rather than carbon-based life forms. And they have a radically different physiology, but they can still think, they can still experience, they could be in pain and have consciousness and so forth. They would still have a mind, but the physical structure in which it is realized would be different than our brains. And that property is called multiple realizability. It's the idea that certain systems, like minds, can be multiply realized. They are multiply realizable. This goes for computers, too. Let's take a simple kind of computer as an example, like a pocket calculator, right? A pocket calculator is one type of calculator. It's one physical realization. It has um, you know, uh, microchips and wires and buttons and so forth and a little screen. That's one kind of calculator. But what about another kind of calculator? What about an abacus? An abacus is a different kind of way to realize a calculator, right? You have uh, wooden beads sitting on these wooden uh, kind of rails that you can move about to represent numbers, and you can perform arithmetic on an abacus just like you can on a pocket calculator if you know how. So we could say that simple computers like calculators are multiply realizable, and we can say the same thing about the mind. Now here's a pretty counterintuitive idea for you. If cognitive systems are multiply realizable, and if you're a functionalist, uh, that's probably what you think, then it might even be a mistake to focus on the brain, right? It might even be a mistake to focus on 
the physical structures rather than the functional relations. Um, if we focused on the brain too much, we might accidentally take as essential certain, um, you know, uh, structures in the brain uh, or take as essential to cognitive processes certain structures in the brains which are really not essential to that cognitive process but are just contingent upon how human brains evolved, right? This is a bit like saying um, if we found a, a calculator in the desert, you know, let's do like a William Paley type of watchmaker experiment, right? <laughs> let's, let's say we find a pocket calculator in the desert and we think, oh, this is a calculating machine, and we study the physical makeup of it, and we, we mistakenly might conclude to make a calculator, you would have to have this exact physical realization. You'd have to have this microchip and this configuration of buttons and so forth, right? But that's obviously a mistake, because we can also have a calculator by building ourselves an abacus if we want to, right? So this is one of the reasons, as I mentioned, that... Um, you know, cognitive scientists and philosophers of mind didn't really worry too much about the brain, especially post-Turing. Uh, Not really until the 1980s when we got uh, really good uh, PET scan technology, really good uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, and we could look at what's happening in the brain in, in uh, fairly good temporal resolution, but also very good spatial resolution. We did have electroencephalography for a long time, which has really good uh, temporal resolution, but very poor spatial resolution. So uh, EEG was used a little bit in neuroscience, but also a lot in medicine, uh, as it still is today. So, um, you know, it's because of these ideas, because of Turing and Putnam and so forth, that, you know, for a long time we didn't worry about what was going on in the brain. Now, of course, we do. Now we'd like to see what's happening in the brain. Uh, but uh, for a long time, cognitive scientists thought maybe it would even be a mistake to look at the brain. Somewhat ironically, though, some of the things that we know about the brain actually do kind of support functionalism. Some of these things that we know about the brain which support functionalism include neuroplasticity, right? We can regain neural connections and cognitive functions that we've lost due to some kind of acquired brain injury right? Perhaps you have a severe blow to a head or you suffer a stroke and some of your brain tissue dies. You'll lose the functions that are associated or implemented with that particular bit of brain tissue. But because of neuroplasticity, your brain can kind of rewire itself and learn how to do things over again. Those neural connections are going to be different than the neural connections you had before injury. So it's a different physical realization. Even though it's still the brain, it's a different configuration of neurons and firing patterns and so forth. So neuroplasticity actually supports uh, functionalism and multiple realizability. Animal minds, too. This is something that Putnam points out in some of his other papers. Humans can feel pain, obviously, um, but so can non-human animals. Many people would argue this is a point that I'm sure somebody like Lemaitre would be very much behind. Uh, animals can also reason in basic ways, and some animals can reason in very advanced ways, like um, elephants, cetaceans, uh, certain birds, uh, definitely the great apes. Um, but our brains are not exactly the same, so that also supports functionalism and multiple realizability. There's also a very interesting... A hypothesis known as the neural reuse hypothesis. It used to th it used to be thought that different brain areas were associated with particular functions. Um, you know, like for example, my favorite is the fusiform face area. The fusiform face area is an area in the fusiform gyrus in your brain um, that is a very active when we are looking at the faces of other people, right? So that's a uh, good reason to think, it was thought, that the fusiform face area was, you know, f a face detection uh, part of the brain, you know, for detecting when we're, you know, recognizing the face, uh, uh, an unfamiliar face versus a familiar face or something, right? But it turns out that the fusiform face area is actually a general purpose pattern recognizer. It's just that we use it primarily for 
recognizing faces. Those are a very salient pattern, you know, two eyes, a nose, a mouth. Uh, that's a salient pattern for the human being because we're social animals and we need to deal with other people all the time. But if you look, for example, up at the brains of really, really good chess players, as Adrian de Groot did, um, you will see that these chess players, we're talking expert chess players, you know, we're talking uh, master to grandmaster level. They are actually able to recognize uh, different configurations of chess boards from different stages in famous games of chess. How do they do that? They use their fusiform gyrus, the fusiform face area, to recognize these chess games. So, uh, that's neural reuse. And of course, this supports the idea of multiple realizability, the idea that uh, different functions can be implemented by similar structures, kind of uh, fits nicely with our idea that um, different structures can implement the same function. Both of these support um, multiple realizability and functionalism. They do so particularly by suggesting that cognitive functions can be implemented in different kinds of brain structures. And we could call this like a weak functionalism if we wanted to. And contrast that with um, a strong functionalism, which would be something like uh, we don't need to look at the brain at all. I think most um, philosophers and cognitive scientists nowadays are probably what you'd call weak functionalists rather than strong functionalists. Now, if functionalism is true, what about machines? Do they have minds? Do they think? Well, we're going to come back to that next time. Uh, but the short answer is yes, because it doesn't really matter how you implement your mind, whether you're doing it in uh, um, a carbon-based brain or a silicon-based brain or a computer of some kind, right? It doesn't matter if your calculator is a pocket calculator or an abacus. What matters is that it calculates, right? That's the idea. So, of course, we could make a machine that could think. Now, we're going to dive into this stuff in more detail next time. Uh, today, we've just covered basics about the ideas of functionalism and multiple realizability. But we're going to look at these uh, ideas in a little bit more detail next time when we dive a little bit deeper into Putnam's paper. Um, I'll say a little bit more about formal systems. Now that we have the general idea of functionalism laid out, I want to tell you more about formal systems and functional systems. Um, and I also want to tell you a little bit about what Putnam has to say about Turing machines and mines. And finally, I think it's really important to cover a little bit of what Putnam says about how all of this applies to the mind-body problem, because that is a problem that we've encountered previously in this class. And I also want to talk a little bit about identity theory, because identity theory is kind of what Putnam is responding to here with all of this functionalism talk. So we'll talk a little bit about identity theory, which is a uh, basically a physicalist theory of the mental that says that uh, mental states are just identical to brain states, thus identity theory. So we'll talk a little bit about different kinds of identity theory, and then we'll see how uh, what Putnam has to say is actually a kind of a response to identity theory. So that's it for today. Um, let me know if you have any questions, and I will see you all shortly for our next lecture, Machine Functionalism Part 2. Bye for now, everyone.